Warning. What you are about to see is not for the faint heart. I have shown you. Don't be afraid. Just follow. Goddess Hollywood, for all her glamour and glory, is often shown a nasty habit of consuming her offspring, cannibalizing her own flesh and blood like a black widow spider. Garfield, Barrymore, Keaton, many others all have, for one reason or another, fallen victim to Hollywood's sinister syndrome. Oh, the studios would tell you that the stars did themselves in, or that audiences finally determine who curries favor in Tinseltown, but one man, symbolic of a Hollywood when stars walked the world like gods, forever became a regal symbol of horror, a standard by which all chills are gauged, a legend whose very name became synonymous with the mysterious, the monstrous, the macabre, Bela Lugosi. Welcome to Grizzly Land. Come, enter the Acker Museum, if you dare. The story is begun. Dad has become so iconic that he'll, he'll be forever remembered for his portrayal of Count Dracula. And uh, every day that I mention my name to somebody, you know, they react to it. It's, it's um, really amazing. I don't think he ever thought that he would be remembered the way he is now. Bela Blasco adopted his stage name from his hometown in Lugos, Hungary, a mere 50 miles from Dracula's home in Transylvania. The youngest of four children, Lugosi felt the lure of the stage early on, always finding it difficult to attend school when he could stage makeshift plays in old buildings in town. Constant run-ins with his father, Istvan, over this fact, led to Bela's departure from home in 1893. After a period of small roles in local theater, Bela made it to the major stage in 1902. Soon he received invitations from two major theaters in Budapest. Lugosi chose the prestigious National Theater for the diversity of roles its membership provided. You see, in the National Theater of Hungary in Budapest, all the great character parts are played by four or five different players. Each competes with the other. Each plays a part in accordance with their own conception. And the audience is just as much interested in the actor's conception of the role than it's interested in the play itself. Bela joined the growing Hungarian film industry in 1917, hoping to supplement his income from the National Theater. He debuted in The Leopard and through his roles as a leading man became a matinee idol in the eyes of the Hungarian public. He was always embroiled in politics, starting uh, when he was trying to help the Actors Union in Hungary from the uh, regime that had taken over, a revolutionary regime. Lugosi was on the communist blacklist along with notables Paul Lucas, Alexander Korda, and film director Michael Curtiz. Well, why did you leave Hungary? Political reasons. After the war, I participated in the revolution, and later, I found myself on the wrong side. In 1921, a political fugitive from his homeland, he connived his way onto an Italian freighter, and, without papers, sailed to America. Upon reaching port in New Orleans, he jumped ship and landed on American soil, penniless, a stranger in a strange land. 
He moved to New York in 1921 and joined the local Hungarian organizations in order to feel more at home. When he was, when he was here in America, he was a, you know, a very staunch American. He became a naturalized citizen, but uh, he would attend rallies you know, for America. And he, he read both the English newspapers and Hungarian newspapers. Uh, you know, they have different slants on things politically, but he was well read on both sides of the question. What are you studying now? I'm studying now American slang. I know how to say okay and cats, whiskers and baloney and and how. <laughs> Soon after, he formed a local Hungarian theater group for which he wrote, directed, and acted in shows in his native tongue. Though Bela's reticence toward the English language was an early obstacle, his intense desire to continue the film career he had begun in Hungary led him from New York to Hollywood. By the early 20s, Bela was working in film, albeit sporadically. He continued, however, to sharpen his image as a man about town and lady killer, as in his early theater days, and married Beatrice Weeks, a wealthy society woman. Bela and his new bride couldn't quite see eye to eye on Bela's old world expectations of marriage, and three days later, the honeymoon and the marriage was over. Unable to find steady employment in Hollywood, Bela returned to New York, seeking film roles. One such film was The Midnight Girl, in which he played a lecherous theater owner competing for the affections of young Lila Lee. Meanwhile in London, the revival of the stage version of Bram Stoker's 1897 novel Dracula was attracting attention. It had been called the last of the great Gothic romances and was originally done in 1923. Producers hired Lugosi for the New York production of Dracula. Bailey nearly refused the part due to its sparse dialogue. The play was rewritten and updated and opened in 1927 on Broadway. It was an instant success and played over 1,000 performances, then went on the road with Bela for the next two years. It was billed with great hoopla as the ultimate in horror. And the producers even had nurses in attendance for the faint-hearted. Did you see the play? No, I didn't. I'm awfully sorry. But what kind of uh, makeup did you use? Well, I can show it to you on the picture, I promised you. Oh, I'd love to see it. Here it is. How frightfully weird. Isn't so much a makeup. It's rather expression. I'm afraid I'll dream about this myself tonight. <laughs> you flatter. The cast remained in Los Angeles in 1928 and Bela began to be flooded with fan mail. More producers were taking note as well. After three seasons, the stage Dracula had earned well over two and a half million dollars. My dad grew up in New York, um, and when he was 13 years old in 1927, um, he discovered Broadway. And one of the first shows he went to see <coughs> was a show called Dracula, starring none other than Bela Lugosi. My dad had what they call chutzpah, and he, uh, he asked the stage manager, he said, I'm a friend of Mr. Lugosi's, I'd like to go meet him. And Mr. Lugosi apparently couldn't have been nicer or more charming. And he said, what's your name? He said, I'm William Schloss. And my dad's original name was Schloss. And Mr. Lugosi said, Schloss? Schlosh? Schlosh? And that's right then my father decided I have to change my name. <clears throat> and then he changed it to the English translation, which is Castle. I think he fell in love with, uh, with the family of theater and then eventually the family of motion pictures. Bela began taking small roles, primarily those for Fox Studios, but soon talkies arrived and Bela's career stalled a bit after the close of Dracula. He feared, as other great silent actors did, that he would not succeed in talkies because of his language problems. He had a few more minor roles, then fate smiled on him. He met up with director Todd Browning, who cast him in a mystery, The Thirteenth Chair, in 1929. This was a turning point in Bela's career and foreshadowed things to come as the legendary director led Bela to the fulfillment of his greatest screen destiny, the film version of Dracula. Well, what was your first mystery play? It was Dracula. Oh, did the role depress you? 
very much. Haunted me. Bela had become a U.S. citizen in 1930, the same year Universal decided to film Dracula. But Lugosi didn't come by the role easily. The renowned actor Lon Chaney Sr. was tapped for the role by the studio, but in a bizarre twist of fate, fell ill and died shortly after being cast. The studio looked over at least five other actors with half the poise of Lugosi. It remains a mystery why. Idiots! Imbecile, it's all of you! Carol Borland, a drama student, had played opposite Bela as Lucy Harker in the stage version of Dracula. If Lugosi had made his test for Dracula before he put together a company to do the stage version of Dracula. And I was Lucy to his Dracula in that company, and we got as far as the Lovero Theater in Santa Barbara when he was called back being told that he had the part. That was just the opening of Dracula. I said the first lines of dialogue. Can you imagine that? I, I didn't realize at the time how important it was, the first lines. Among the rugged peaks that frown down upon the Gorbo Pass are found crumbling castles of a bygone age. I say driver, a bit slower. Todd Browning's personal preference finally prevailed, and Lugosi was signed to a five-year contract with Universal where he would make his most significant films. My friends, this is the greatest moment of my life. Universal had Lugosi in a corner, however. Realizing the importance of the role, Bela reluctantly agreed to the paltry sum of $500 a week for seven weeks' work as the Thirsty Count. In later years, as the horror classic would be released year after year, this fact would prove a bitter pill for Lugosi to swallow. It was all worth it, though. Lugosi and Dracula ushered in a series of what would become some of the most fantastic films ever created. I am Dracula. With all this, I, I thought I was in the wrong place. I bid you welcome. Listen to them, children of the night. What music they make. The film premiered Valentine's Day, 1931, billed as a gothic romance. Lugosi gave such a complete performance as he had many times on stage that he literally became Dracula to millions. Ouch! Oh, it's nothing serious, just a small cut from that paper clip. It's just a scratch. He needed no special makeup, no props. His character was truly created from within. Women were mesmerized by his hypnotic presence. He received scores of fan mail and skyrocketed to instant stardom. Well, Lugosi was known as the ladies' man. And he was the, probably the, the most sexually attractive male I have ever known in my life. He could walk into a room and it, there was this pull from every corner and people just, women just flocked to him. Handsome devil, isn't he? I'd hate to meet him in a dark alley. Oh, I don't know. Make it a moonlight night in a park bench. It might be exciting. And I thought that was sort of funny, although I could feel it. Dracula was a smash. Bela could rest easy now because in Hollywood he ruled the roost and for a brief time could lay claim to the crown that read King of Horror. Universal announced it would next adapt Mary Shelley's gothic chiller Frankenstein. In Robert Florey's original screenplay, Lugosi was to play Dr. Frankenstein. Studio execs insisted that he be cast in the part of the monster, having done so well as Dracula. James Whale eased himself in as director and Florey was out. Suddenly, the picture had drastically changed. Lugosi reluctantly submitted to Jack Pierce's makeup, and test footage was actually shot. But in the end, Bela bowed out, frustrated over the monster's lack of dialogue. 
what I've heard is that um, Baylor turned it down because he didn't want to do the role uh, due to the fact that there was so much makeup um, and there were no lines and Baylor was not comfortable doing the part having been trained as a classic an uh, actor and um, so he turned the role down and, and then they went, Universal went looking for a replacement. Uh, the story goes that my father was at the right place at the right time, on the right corner at the right time. James Whale sent somebody over and, and asked my father to come to his table and said, Mr. Karloff, you have an interesting face. And he asked him if he would test for the part of the creature. And at that point, my father would have jumped at any role, being a speaking part or not. Karloff went on to essay one of filmdom's finest hours. Bela had hoped that his stardom in Dracula would pave the way to diverse roles, but instead he became hopelessly typed, an ironic and cruel tribute to his effectiveness as Dracula. Well, would you like to play in any more mystery parts in the future? Yes, why not? I can't see it. They are very interesting. But I would rather have uh, it combined with some romance. It has a much greater appeal to the audience and even the box office of the producers would gain more. Now, Dad uh, had become typecast uh, in his 50s because that's the age he was when Dracula came out approximately. And, uh, you know, he was very confident of his ability as an actor because he, you know, really was a star and, and uh, recognized as such all over the world. But once he became typecast, he was very disappointed that he couldn't bring his abilities and his performance, uh, performing arts, to a wider audience, not just the horror audience. Uh, you know, Dracula was important in his life, but I don't think he even comprehended how he has become so iconic and part of American culture and part of the, the beginning of the film industry. As a concession to Bela and Robert Florey, Bela did appear in Murders in the Rue Morgue, which bore a little resemblance to the Edgar Allan Poe story. The film's box office wings, however, were clipped by the overwhelming success of Frankenstein. He avoided the Hollywood party scene and rarely socialized during any shooting. I didn't uh, get to know him very well, really, because he was, uh, he was very occupied with his job. He didn't do any socializing at all on the set. I hardly spoke to him on, outside of a scene. But you have so many friends, Mr. Lugosi. Well, I guess I'm pretty much of a lone wolf. I don't say I don't like people at all, but... To tell you the truth, I only like them if I have a chance to look deep into their heart and, and their mind. The press began to fabricate mysterious stories about him which perpetuated the horror mystique with the movie-going public. Each studio had a roster of stars, uh, musicians, writers, directors, producers, and an enormous uh, publicity unit, um, which put a kind of uh, aura around the film industry and the people in it. They kept the people away from the public as much as possible, as opposed to today. Um, uh, they, they were glamorized. Bela freelanced White Zombie in 1932, a low-budget independent shot in two weeks by the Halperin brothers. 
Problems with this production led to Bailey actually taking a personal hand in the film. The end product is a tribute in itself. It was a brilliant role for Bela as zombie master Murder Legendre, a sinister sorcerer who commands a legion of walking dead. Well, I think everybody loves Dracula, you know. And White Zombie is still, as I, I often feel, as scary today for me as it was when I eventually saw it back in England. It's, it, he sets such a mood. And of course, there are marvelous close-ups of his eyes and the grasping of the hands, which that's the cue for all the zombies to come down the hillside staring ahead. Really, still frightening to me. Because I watched it the other night, and I live alone in this house, and I was a little bit sort of nervous walking down the hall into my bedroom. This is ridiculous, I'm 86, why should I be scared of a movie? That was the potent power of White Zombie. And of course it's all due to that marvelous man who was the star of White Zombie. What are you trying to do to me? I have other plans for Mademoiselle. And I'm afraid you might not agree. I have taken a fancy to you, Monsieur. Silver! Silver! <laughs> Bela then played the sayer of the law in the gruesome classic Island of Lost Souls for Paramount. While at the studio, he took time out to lampoon his Dracula image in a comedy short, Hollywood on Parade. I want to play going down in the rain. Only the ashes remain. Only my voice love. You go along, never dreaming like You have booked your last book. In 1933, Bela eloped to Las Vegas with Lillian Arch, the daughter of a Hungarian acquaintance. This, Lugosi's fourth marriage, provided a long-needed stabilizing force, as Lillian would see Lugosi through the most productive period of his life and the desperate times that were to come. You know, one of the uh, not very well uh, remembered facts about Dad is really the partnership between he and my mother. They were married for 20 years. Uh, and she would be the one that would drive him around and would make sure he had his costume there and would make sure he had, you know, the script or anything that he needed. All the arrangements were, were done by my mom. She's the one that uh, preserved a lot of Dad's memorabilia and artifacts for me. So she played a very important role in keeping Dad's memory alive. Universal's next project for Bela was part of a three-picture deal with Boris Karloff. The Black Cat marked the first teaming of Bela and Boris, a teaming that would become a rivalry. Bela maintained a professional but strained relationship with Karloff throughout their career. Of course, um, there was a kind of a competition between uh, uh, Karloff and, and uh, Bela Lugosi. Uh, not that they were aware of it, that they masterminded or deliberately contrived, but the uh, uh, the two uh, the two men were were uh, uh, I guess symbols of uh, that kind of horror picture at that time. That was marvelous Hollywood hype. Um, it uh, that there was this rivalry between the two actors, um, and it. It sold movie tickets, uh, and it, it, it worked, and why not? And the two people most important to that story knew differently. You know, as far as I could see, they got along well together. I think they respected each other, and they had a right to. Well, my dad, uh, you know, had a relationship with Karloff just because they were in Hollywood at the same time in the same genre. Uh, but they were two very different people. They, they really didn't socialize. 
uh, you know, Karloff like gardening and tea, and Dad like good cigars, good wine, dancing, music, and his Hungarian uh, friends, and not really the Hollywood crowd. Do you ever go to any Hollywood parties? No, life is too short for that. I wouldn't waste my time. There are so many interesting and wonderful things in the world that a man could achieve and experience. Besides, I, I don't even know how to play that, uh, what do you call it, uh, ukulele. How do you like that? The horror men turn out to be crooners. Boris Karloff and Bella Lugosi sing, We hurry for We hurry for them. We hurry for them. We Horrible, horrible men. We are pillars, pillars, pleasures, men. To the crime we come in would make strong men afraid. You can blame us for it, for the rent must be paid. We are horrible, 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 horrible men. It was Christmas time, and in those days they decorated not with Olympic banners, but with uh, stills of the various stars blown up and a circle of Christmas lights around them and tinsel. And uh, it was just when there had been the big smash hit of Frankenstein walking down the street and came to the Karloff one, and he stopped and he bristled and muttered some things in Hungarian and hissed a bit. And we said, but after all, you know, Karloff could never play Dracula. For the test, Dracula, I'm ready. Frankenstein, then let us begin. <laughs> you, you understand, Baylor, don't you? That the one who wins this little game of chess is to lead the parade of the film star's frolic. Okay, Boris, you move. Right. I don't know when my father uh, met Bela for the first time. I believe they made um, seven films altogether. Bela being Hungarian had different personal interests. My father being British, he had different personal interests and hobbies. So they didn't socialize um, offset, but they had a great professional respect for one another. First, you must do something for me. Like what? It's in your line. Like what? Torture and murder? In 1935, Bela went to MGM to remake Lon Chaney Sr.'s London After Midnight. The film was Mark of the Vampire, and it found Lugosi with his old friend, director Todd Browning. Lugosi donned the vampire's cape to play the evil Count Mora, who, with his undead daughter Luna, played by Carol Borland, terrorized a village. Well, Mark of the Vampire, well, I went against his orders, I went against his advice, and he was very right. He said, don't ever do something like this, which is a specific kind of character. I was here, and I saw in Variety, I noticed that they were looking for someone to play Luna, the daughter of the wicked Count Mora and Mark of the Vampire. So I got myself an agent and tore out to MGM and said, I can do that. And they said, oh, no, you're too small. Uh, you're not a brunette the way Lugosi is, uh, although I never thought of him as a brunette because of his beautiful bright blue eyes. So I said I wanted to try it anyway, and they gave me a screen test and said, we will call Lugosi and see how the two of you scale together. So Lugosi came on the set with his cape over his arm. I called him on the phone and I said, I'm up for this. I'm going to play, I'm going to play Luna. But they told me I'm too small, and so he came out on the set with his cape, and they said, um, oh, Mr. Lugosi, you didn't need to bring your, your cape. We just want to see how you two scale together. And he said, I never do the vampire without my cape. So he put his cape on, and he scrunched. Inside the cape, you couldn't see it. And I stood just as tall as I could, and he said, you know, they're pretty good together. <laughs> Scourge of mankind, 
they shall be found. I hereby summon to this place next week every person within the sound of my voice. You shall be judges of this eerie conspiracy. Mark of the Vampire! Baylor came back to Universal to start work on The Raven, which, once again, was only loosely based on Poe. But Karloff and Lugosi were back, the unholy two. Now so popular that they were only billed by their respective last names. Do I look different? Yes. <laughs> Something's the matter. In January of 1937, with the British release of The Raven, Britain imposed a moratorium on horror films, which devastated the American horror film market. In England, kids were not allowed in to see horror pictures, so the first time we saw him was in a movie called Postal Inspector. I went to a, a little revival uh, cinema in England in 1941 when I was 15, and they wouldn't let me in. I went with some school friends to on a Saturday, I think, to get into a matinee, we hoped. And any time an adult came up to the box office, we said, would you take us in with you, please? No, no, nothing doing. So we were, I think the British Board of Film Censors had clapped an X on any horror film at that, at that time. And it wasn't until The Invisible Ray in 1936, which had less horror than some of his other pictures with Boris Karloff, that we actually saw him in a horror-type picture on the screen. I found the place where the meteor fell. I've discovered an element a thousand times more powerful than radium. But it's done something to me. Something horrible. Horrible? Look at me. Look at me in the dark. Why? You're poisoned. Poisoned? And everyone I touch is poisoned. They die. Die? Yes. In 1938, a Los Angeles theater owner, looking for bargain basement programs, would find three cheap film rentals, Universal's Dracula and Frankenstein, and RKO's Son of Kong. Audiences have forgotten what had been only a half decade before and couldn't get enough. The manager and Universal stumbled onto a gold mine. And luckily for Bela, horror films would come into vogue again. As a result, Universal rushed into production on Son of Frankenstein, the third film in the series. The studio, I heard later and read later, was trying to leverage him down in the money. And, and that is history now. And Basil Rathbone and Boris Karloff stood up to the studio to make sure that Bela Lugosi had a fair share income on this role. He added to that film a dimension that is, would, uh, would, could not be replaced by anybody. He was classic. I mean, how many people can play a role like in the, in the laboratory, Frankenstein is on the, on the gurney, and, uh, and Basil Rathbone is asking him about Frankenstein. He said, my friend, my friend, like don't hurt him. Who could have done that but him? How long has he been here? Long time. My friend, he, he does things for me. Has he always been here? Nearly always. This is place of the dead. We're all dead here. But he's not dead. No, not dead. Sleep. Sick. It happened one night, 
when he was outside. Outside? Yes. He was... hunting. Make him well, Frankenstein. I don't know whether I... Your father made him. And Heinrich Frankenstein was your father too. You mean to imply then that... Uh, that is my brother? But his mother was lightning. Classic beyond compare. Bela was especially proud of his portrayal of Igor since the studio gave him creative license to develop his own character. And uh, uh, Bela Lugosi uh, was, a cons was an absolute consummate actor because when he came out in his first costume, he acted even off camera like he was going to be on camera. Uh, and I think, I think, back in the long memory but the good memory, I think I thought he was a different person. His makeup was so radically different from what I saw uh, without makeup, uh, maybe I thought there was a different person. Dad uh, used to rehearse his lines at home, and he'd take one line at a time, and he'd dissect it and put an emphasis on a different word each time until he got that sentence just the way he liked it, and he'd move on to the next sentence. He, he really knew his part and his character. Bela made money again and was able to improve the less than luxurious lifestyle necessity had dictated for some years. But he vowed never again to be extravagant with his money, especially since he had a son now, Bela Jr. Well, my memories of Dad at home uh, were that, uh, you know, he was uh, a good parent. Uh, you know, he loved me and, and my mom and uh, was always trying to teach me something. You know, we never really scratched the surface of how much he could have uh, educated me. You know, from geography to geology to, to music, the arts, politics. He was quite a bit uh, older. He was 56 when I was born, so there was a, quite an, an age gap. But, uh, you know, he uh, made up for that with, with all his years of experience that he could pass on. In 1940, Black Friday teamed Lugosi and Karloff again. Originally entitled Friday the 13th, it was an unusual film, pitting them against each other as rival gangsters. For his death scene in the film, Universal claimed that Bela had been hypnotized to make the action more realistic. So convincing was Lugosi's performance that it wasn't until later that he admitted he was terrified of hypnotism and would not allow it. Recently, newspapers and magazines everywhere carried an amazing story. Reporters saw Dr. Manley Hall hypnotize actor Lugosi to give reality to a scene in Black Friday. Horror struck, they witnessed the hypnotized actor's mortal agony as Lugosi actually experienced the terror of suffocating to death in a closet. Let me out, please! I'm suffocating! <laughs> After wholeheartedly lending himself to the war effort, Lugosi returned as Igor and the Ghost of Frankenstein, this time with Lon Chaney Jr. in the monster makeup. It was a wonderful cast of people, beginning with Bela Lugosi, Sir Cedric Hardwick, Lionel Atwell, um, Lon Chaney Jr. This director I have to describe was a little fellow and he dressed the part. He wore a Norfolk jacket, riding breeches and boots, and a scarf around his neck. And he had a megaphone that when he sat, came up to his eye level, the biggest megaphone I've ever seen, much bigger than Rudy Valley ever had in his heyday. He was seated with his secretary next to him and the megaphone on the other side. And presently the assistant director came up to him and said, we're ready. And uh, he picked up the megaphone. Now the assistant director was standing there. The megaphone was here. He could hardly cram it in. He drew it up and said, get my shankers on the staircase. 
So the assistant director left and came back, and uh, he said, Miss Ankers is on the staircase. So I picked up the megaphone, and the uh, uh, secretary stayed behind and out of the picture, and Evelyn was on the staircase in a, a dressing gown. <clears throat> and uh, uh, from then on, he paced back and forth at the foot of the stairway with the megaphone. And he said, now, Evelyn, your mother's been carried away by the Frankenstein monster. It's four o'clock in the morning. The servants have all fled. Your lover's being chased over the moors by the dogs. And you're all alone in this ancient, slimy, oozy castle. And I want to get the feeling from you when you come down these stairs that you're fed up with it all. He was very patient with me. Uh, I had to memorize the lines before and after what I would say and he was totally patient he'd say take your time and I okay you know <laughs> but yeah that's what I would I can remember him speaking to me while we were uh, doing a scene and he would be very quiet and very very low I, I thought he was excellent because, like I said, he was always humped over in the, in the movie, and that was not the way he was, but he played the part very well, I thought. Eleven years after he first refused the role, Lugosi submitted a Jack Pierce's makeup to portray the monster in Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman. As with most of the Frankenstein pictures, the final script deviated considerably from the original concept. In this entry, the monster was to have been blind, as was indicated in the climax of Ghost of Frankenstein. Yet all references to this were eventually deleted, causing Bela's performance to appear awkward and stiff. The film finally became a sequel to The Wolfman, since fashioning another Frankenstein sequel proved too difficult for Universal. The 40s were a transitional time for Bela. Firmly typecast in horror films, he never seemed to give up hope that someday he could return to the very characterizations of his youth. I know you are always yearning, as all actors are, to do a different type of stage vehicle. What would you like to do? The romantic? The... No, I would uh, prefer to play comedy. <laughs> you see, after I, I finished now playing a half a year Dracula on the stage, I was called to make a picture here in London called Vampire Over London. It was a, a horror part, but the situation was so funny that really it caused his laugh. So I really enjoyed it. And one day, before we started shooting, he had everybody laughing. So folks who think that Bela Lugosi was just a wonderful monster character were wrong. He had a great personality. He could get real sophisticated people laughing. Dad had a, had a good sense of humor. I think maybe maybe most intelligent people do. I don't know. He would uh, he would not be very good at telling the joke, but he would get the joke. <laughs> uh, you interest me, young man. I do. Yes. Why don't you pull up a slab and lie down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got a, uh, some uh, brushes here. I'd like to show you here. I'm sure that you'll be interested in them. At all kinds, you know. These brushes are important. Yeah. Perfect. I knew you'd like them. <laughs> and I'm used too. <laughs> and if there's anything you want or need, yeah. just say the magic word. What? Chichonia. Chichonia? Yes, that's the magic heel. That's the magic word, right. Chichonia. <laughs> you kill people on the screen, you also kill jokes. <laughs> I've never heard of such a thing in my life. He saw himself as a competent professional, and he was. After all, I'd heard him do Shakespeare and these other things. He was good. He was versatile. He should have been used as they used um, Ezio Pinza later. The charming, attractive, middle-aged European gentleman. And he very seldom got a chance to show that side of him. This is Bela Lugosi. Everybody here in the United States thinks of me only as a character in horror pictures. And I'm getting a little bit uh, tired of hearing the audiences come away from the theater saying, Wasn't Lugosi frightful? Boo! I wouldn't mind being a monster for the rest of my life. Honest, I wouldn't. If only one picture, just one teensy, wincy little picture, I could play a, a nice guy. 
I don't think Hollywood ever really realized his full potential because in many of his films at 20th Century Fox, he was playing roles other than horror. It probably did not seem to the Hollywood producers that he was as versatile as Boris Karloff, who could play so many different kinds of roles. So they kept returning him to horror roles. But I think if given a chance, because for instance in Ninochka with Greta Garbo under Ernst Lubitsch's direction, you can also see that he's perfectly capable of playing other types of roles. And I think if given the chance, he might have surprised Hollywood producers and audiences. There are some examples of you know, films where he wasn't the boogeyman. Uh, one of those is Nanachka. He had a very small part, but when, when he was on screen, that's who you were looking at just because he had such a commanding presence. Uh, when he played um, uh, Igor, for example, he put a comic touch in there in playing that part, and he really wasn't the bad guy other than being a grave robber, I suppose, makes you a bad guy. Uh, but he wasn't the, the heavy in the movie. Getting back to Bela and, and the fact that English was my father's first language, it's easier to have a sense of humor about life and about oneself if you're doing it in your first language. And so, again, it was easier for my father to, to embrace the various mediums of the industry in his first language than it would have been for Bela. Through the 40s and 50s, he would not work for a major studio again with one exception. Now that Britain had relaxed its restrictions on horror films, Bela returned to England, hoping to pick up some better parts. He scored big in Dark Eyes of London in a dual role. The film itself was quite gruesome and shocking, as Lugosi, aided by a deformed, blind monster, drowns his victims for their insurance money. You know where the young lady lives, Jake. She's a difficult young woman, Jake. Perhaps you better see her safely home. He returned to the stage to Producers Releasing Corporation, possibly the lowest of all B units, to star in the better than average feature, The Devil Bath. as you did before I made you big and strong. <laughs> now, if you detect the fragrance in the night, then you're fully awake. <coughs> you will strike. <coughs> yes, you will strike. It was during this most lean of times for Bela that he began treatment for chronic leg pains and an ulcer. Unfortunately, these treatments would prove worse than the illness, as would soon become apparent. As time passed, Lugosi could no longer worry about the kinds of roles he was accepting. Long frozen out by the majors, he simply needed work. I had... Uh an alarming experience with him. I had a scene where I was, we were in a dark cave or some place that was very dark and mysterious. And he is in a coffin. And I came in, why? I don't remember, it was a long time ago. But I had a monkey wrench in my hand. And as I came up to the coffin, he's supposed to rise up, you know, the dead man comes to life. And I scream, of course, that's so dramatic. And <laughs> when he arose in the coffin on the actual take, in the darkness and the spookiness of it, he scared the living daylights out of me. And I'm supposed to hit him with the, with the monkey wrench. And I really, wham, I really hit him so he fell back in the, and I was concerned because even though the monkey wrench was a, had a wire in the middle of it so it would bend, it was not a real wrench, it was rubber, you know. But I nearly killed him, really. <laughs> but uh, that was, he, he scared me, he frightened me. 
As I say, he was a very realistic actor. Baylor's main bulk of work in the 40s was for the B Picture Factory, known as Monogram Studios, long the home of Charlie Chan and the Bowery Boys. Hardly preoccupied with competing with the major studios, Monogram was more concerned with churning out second bill product on a weekly basis. Still, it was work, and Bela treated his roles with a professionalism they rarely deserved. Producers like Sam Katzman could always count on Lugosi for a 100% performance. I have come a long way to see you. Plenty of other good doctors. I'm a very sick man. The city of the dead. Do they too hear the howling of the frightened dogs? <laughs> Why do you beat my son so hard? Because he's a beast, an animal. And someday I shall have to destroy him. Dormitory of the dead. Never saw a guy with more angles. These mildewed skeletons who sleep so quietly now were once my partners, like Stratton. But how often have I told you to keep that cat from desecrating my graves? Let's go, Frankie. Our place is not to be the dead. Their work is done. Ours is just beginning. What have you there, Merkel? There are too many rats in this house. They should be done away with. You haven't put out enough cups. Mr. and Mrs. Rutherford, are they to have it too? All of them. Bela teamed with John Carradine for his last two films at Monogram. Voodoo Man was the first, a tale of young girls and zombies. And in Return of the Ape Man, the two attempt to civilize a prehistoric man by a brain transplant. A picture that would take uh, eight weeks and a major studio would take three weeks for monogram. We had no time between takes at all. I know that they they didn't uh, have to spend as much money on a picture as Universal did, but uh, it didn't show on the set. They had good actors and they paid them what they wanted. They just shot faster. You know, some people's brains would never be missed. I've often thought that. <laughs> well, then, of course, yeah, he was absolutely fantastic in The Hate Man. Fantastic. And I think he did his own makeup. This is my, in my memory, that, and that's unusual. Because, you see, the makeup department is a big, 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 big stuff in motion pictures. They can make your face any way they want it and make you look any way they want. But he did his own. Now that's what I, one thing I remember.
the voodoo man was kind of vague because, you know, we just sort of floated around in the air and didn't say anything. But it was kind of effective as a production, but not for an actress. I mean, you, you, you had no chance to do anything. In The Voodoo Man, we had very little association. But when, when between scenes in the, uh, the Ape Man, I had a chance to talk to him from time to time. And I had, I had huge respect for him because he was very intelligent, very knowledgeable, and very modest. He had all kinds of good features because being an intellectual, he could have been very pompous. But he was, he was quiet and, and polite and nice and unobtrusive, but he could enter in if he felt the occasion was right. Very good. You might go and uh, tell Nicholas to make the preparations. Yes, Master. Yes, sir. Just what is this? I must apologize for receiving a guest like this. Guest? What is this, a joke or something? Let me out of here. I'm afraid that is quite impossible. I need you. You need me? Yes. What for? Come. I'll show you. Don't be afraid. Just follow me. My dear, I brought a young lady to help you, Miss... Uh... Saunders. Stella Saunders. Yes, my wife. This young lady may be able to help you. Is your wife ill? She's dead. Dead? She has been dead for 22 years. How can she be dead then? She's dead only in the sense that you understand that word. I'm on the threshold of bringing her back to complete life. And you may be able to help. What? What do you want of me? Your will to live. Your mind. Oh, no. No. Don't look at me like that. Come with me. In 1948, Bela as Dracula was given a last coup de grace. Universal was preparing Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. It would feature the Wolfman and the Vampire Count himself. This time he was paid $1,500 a week for 10 weeks. Again he dominated the movie, showing the same vampiric charm he had 18 years earlier. Count Dracula sleeps in this coffin, but rises every night at sunset. Chick is right. This is awful silly stuff. I remember um, uh, one time that I was on the set, uh, and that was th during the filming of Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Uh, I, had, I had been on a set before, not that I remember it, but I've seen pictures of myself when I was very young uh, with, uh, I believe, Frankenstein. Um, whoever was playing it at the time, maybe it was Karloff. 
Uh, but at any rate, at Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, I, I still have a very clear memory uh, of that experience because it was, it was so unique. Uh, it was a dark comedy in a way, a dark set, and so they hired comedians to walk around and you know make jokes and keep the atmosphere light. That was interesting. Uh, and during the breaks, uh, I would have uh, bouillon or something to drink with the Wolfman or Frankenstein. <laughs> Uh, and I, I also remember that Dad was very well respected on the set. You know, he, he was he was able to do one take, and if there's any more than one take, it's because somebody else made a mistake. And that's just the way he was. He uh, uh, believes in the work ethic, and he would go over and over his lines. So when he showed up on the set, he knew his part. And, uh, and he got a lot of respect from the other people uh, on the set for that. He was staying true to his character, which was Count Dracula. He was not saying, ha ha, I'll go along with a gag. He was, and they were just creating chaos all around him, which is part of their shtick, of course. And I don't know if they had rehearsed it much before, but I admired him so much. He brought such dignity and such composure to what he was doing, which made the chaos they were creating even more effective. He, he was really doing a beautiful acting job. You know, when they were doing Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein in 1948, uh, well, Bela played Dracula, actually for the second time, you might say, you know. And uh, he was a very serious actor. Well, you know, he was in with Abbott and Costello. Well, you can't be too serious with those guys. Mainly Costello. He'll do anything in the world to break you up if he can. And Glenn Strange, who was like my own dad, played the monster again, and he loved it. And uh, every time... Lou would always look at poor Bela and he knew what button to push with him. And so he would always do something to mess up Bela. Like there's a scene where he's coming down the stairs and he had this, this guy, Billy Barber, which is a, or Bobby Barber, I'm sorry, what was his clown, you might say, that he kept on set with him. He had him behind Bela coming down doing a thing like, you know, that type of a thing. And, and so then everybody was laughing and, and Bela thought they were all laughing at him because he didn't know the guy was behind him, you know, so he just kind of stopped and just kind of quit the scene and said, what are you laughing at, what, you know? And so then they, he looked and there he is, you know, and, and, and of course, Carlos Castello is just dying. He's in the corner laughing like crazy. So finally, Vela comes down and he says, you know, they should not be laughing when they're working. And he went to his trailer and wouldn't come up for half an hour, you know? And that happened to him on a, a U.S. for it show years ago too, where he came and he's gonna do, talk about, he was with a magician. Well, the magician kind of took over and Bela didn't really know what was going on. Nobody really filled him in, you know? In a blood-curdling new role, you ask for it. Ever since seeing Dracula, I have been an ardent admirer of that fine character actor, Bela Lugosi. I have missed his unusual roles on the screen recently. Could you arrange for me to see him on your show, Mrs. Fraser? Mrs. Fraser, with a great deal of pride, that we present to you now the great character actor, Bela Lugosi, in a, a television premiere of a new role, that of Master Illusionist. For you now, he presents that weird vampire bat illusion. The 1950s saw the declining fortunes of Bela Lugosi reach their nadir. Bitter that he could not shake his horror image and still coping with an increasingly serious drug addiction, Bela was forced to further prostitute his art just to keep food on the table. Go get the girl. The cabinet. He put together a touring horror show to open for his B pictures across the country as an added attraction. The results only proved that the audiences were much too young to remember the great actor and provide him with the respect he so desperately needed. Earlier, Richard and Alex Gordon took Bela to England for a revival of Dracula. His fans came out in droves to support him. He was a very cultured gentleman, as most Europeans of his class uh, were, and uh, he had a great sense of humor and he would enjoy telling 
little stories and jokes and so on, and really uh, came over as a very, very pleasant personality and completely unlike all the horror things that he did on the screen. But his main interest at that time, and I realized that was one of the purposes why he wanted to meet with us, is that he wanted to do a tour of England in a revival of Dracula. You see, I'm 30 years here in America, and uh, eight months ago, I was called to come to England to revive the American version of Dracula. Doesn't Dracula ever end for you? No, no. Dracula never ends. I don't know whether I shall call it a fortune or a cause, but it never ends. Nearing I the end of his life, Lugosi had finally accepted the fact that his relationship with Dracula was an eternal one. Never before or since has one actor been so irrevocably tied with a fictional literary character. In 1953, Lugosi joined forces with young exploitation film director Ed Wood to make what would be his last films. The legendary Wood was chiefly responsible for keeping Bela working during his lowest ebb and remained a trusted friend to the end. In the later years, near the end of his life, when he was you know, in his 70s, he did get a lot of jobs from Ed Wood, who was a director. And, uh, you know, some of these are, are pretty bad films. Uh, Dad always gave a good performance. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, that kept him busy and working, which is appreciated. But on the other hand, you know, Ed Wood was using Dad's name and celebrity to further his own uh, ambition. So it was an interesting relationship. I knew Ed Wood and had met him and talked to him. Yeah, well, I, I had the, the pleasure, and I, I mean pleasure, of knowing Ed Wood. Uh, everybody used to think he was a con artist and all this kind of... He wasn't. He really wasn't. Uh, like, he, he would talk to you out of money, I mean, because he wanted to make his films. But all of the money went into his films. Now, everybody says also he made the worst movies ever made. I No, that's not true. If you've ever seen the, the carpet that chews up people and the creeping on their creeping flesh or whatever the heck that thing was called. Now, there's a bad film. But, you know, at least he got films made and got them out there. I mean, I know a lot of guys that talk a lot and they've never done it, you know. But one thing that, that he had, he had the drive, the passion. I mean, he wanted to make good films. I mean, that's what he was trying to do. He wasn't, you know, he had no budget, no money, but he, he tried like crazy. And the thing I always say, what he didn't have, and it's unfortunate, was taste and talent to do it you know but he got him done and I respect that and I saw him later on and he was all bloated from drinking and uh, he just I mean he was a handsome guy when he was a young guy but now he was just all bloated and stuff and he came to me one more time it's about six months before he died I worked at CBS and he came down to see me and he said Bob I've, I've got a, a new idea for a film he said I can't tell you what it is because we're working on it you know but I said some of the old team's going to be there and blah 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 and I'm just trying to get some money and I, and I knew what it was for it was for booze I'm sure you know uh, and so I had 50 bucks on me and I gave it to him him and uh, and I didn't feel bad about it I mean I knew where it was going about six months later is when he passed away and I've been very sad about that because he, he's gotten a, a bad rap and he didn't deserve it and, and Bela he gave Bela extra life he did it was like almost like father and son that whole thing was he loved Bela Bela loved him because he brought him kind of out of obscurity you know and he loved Bela he wanted to keep him working and like I said I think he gave him extra life that maybe he wouldn't have had Hold the string. While I was still in New York, I wrote a script for Bela Lugosi called The Atomic Monster initially, which eventually became Bride of the Monster. film that the exhausted Lugosi committed himself a haunted shell of a man to the Metropolitan State Hospital for treatment to help rid himself of the awful drug addiction he had medically incurred years earlier. Doctors were amazed that Bela was even still alive. And yet, after just weeks of treatment, he began a strong recovery. I'm cured. You're cured. Yes, I'm very grateful to the state uh, hospital that I, they allowed me and took me when I volunteered. You see, previously I was in a private sanatorium, but they, were, they weren't as strict, so I was, uh, I was afraid it was going to take too long. But now we made a short cut. It was very... How long have you been in the institution, Mr. Three months. Three months. Because 90 days is the state law. Mm -hmm. It's minimum. What did you weigh when you came in, Rod, or how much underweight were you when you entered the... Oh, I was 45 pounds underweight. 45? Yes. Have you put most of that back? Oh, yes, I regained 21 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you feel like your old self again. 
You I feel like a million dollars. You feel like practically a really well, Sure. Yeah. That's his best. I was looking forward to work again. By the time I met Bela, I actually got to meet him, was we had a CBS thing when I worked at CBS. They gave, uh, he had just gotten out of the hospital from getting off drugs and stuff, and they gave some sort of an award to people that had overcome handicaps and stuff, and so, he, so I got to sit in with him when he's being made up, because I knew the makeup guy there. And we talked for about an hour, I guess, and he was so happy that he'd kicked this stuff. He was just really, you know, thin as a rail. But he, his mind was bright and clear, and he was just so happy. I mean, he cried when he got the award. But he was a, a delightful guy, very, very nice guy to talk to. Uh, we, you know, I even talked to him about the old Chandu serials he made. So it wasn't just about Bailey and the horror stuff. A lot of other stuff he did, and uh, he enjoyed it. He thought it was real fun. He didn't enjoy Abbott Custom Eat Frankenstein too much, and, and and he said why? He said well, I just couldn't get along with some of the people there. He didn't say who, but you, know, you got you know who it was. But his divorce a year earlier from Lillian had taken its toll. He married a fifth and final time to Hope Leninger. I have a, had a very young wife. She was 30 years younger than I, and she said that uh, perhaps she has a right to be happy not to be chained to an old man. <laughs> In the early 50s, I would see Bela about uh, three or four times every week, and Eddie Wood and I had written three additional scripts. And we were always sort of giving him hope that we were working very actively and trying to get projects going for him. There were several projects, Dr. Voodoo, The Vampire's Tomb, The Phantom Ghoul scripts that we had completed that he was reading and commenting on, and he was hoping that those would eventually go. The man I was to see was a casting director, and he said, well, um, you know, that, that there's something, something with Lugosi going on at the old Chaplin studio which was a very small studio on La Brea Avenue. Then he said the magic words. He said, OK, let's go see Bella. And I thought, I'm really going to be Dracula. And there were some work lights on, and there, sitting in a, a mock-up of a jail cell, was Bela Lugosi. He, Garbo, Boris Karloff, to me, were idols of mine. They, they were almost pioneers at the beginning of Sound 1931. And uh, this was like looking at an icon. He, he seemed frail, tired, very pale. Uh, I would have said, had I not known who he was, or just an old fellow, not in the best of health. How about your plans? When are you going to bring your distinguished acting back to the screen, sir? Well, uh, there are a few things coming up. Uh, the first is a three-dimensional motion picture called Phantom Ghoul. Mm. And the second is a television series which will be produced by Ted Allen and called Dr. Acula. Dracula? Dracula? For heaven's sake, no! Just Dr. Acula, I see. <laughs> I had an assignment uh, playing the star part in uh, The Guru Goes the Best. Uh -huh. Yes. And, uh, Eddie Woods, Eddie, Eddie Woods. will be the producer. And, uh, right, you'll enter that as soon as you leave. Ed Wood had planned a film called Grave Robbers from Outer Space. With a budget of only a few hundred dollars, he shot some footage of Bela in a derelict graveyard. Well, in January of 1956, uh, Bela Lugosi had already just, I think, just completed The Black Sleep. And I believe that the set that the casting director took me to to meet him had been part of the set of, of The Black Sleep. As I said, it was a, a jail set, and, uh, but Mr. Lugosi was not in, in makeup or wardrobe, so that was in the past. I can only conclude that this was, I would say, a new project, and uh, so new, in fact, that the two pages of dialogue I'd read with the casting director didn't have a title on them, maybe a number of, of, the, of the next movie. And sadly, as of course we find out later, to be his last movie, because I believe that he passed away in August, of that year, 1956. A few days later and without warning, Bela Lugosi quietly departed this world, found in bed clutching a script for a film called, ironically, The Final Curtain. August 16th, 1956, the day Prince Serki claimed Count Dracula, Bela Lugosi, King of the Undead. Wood completed his film using a double for Bela, and the picture was released in 1959 as the cult classic Plan 9 from Outer Space. I was at Bela Lugosi's funeral, and for about five minutes before the ceremony, I stood 
very quietly by his casket, regarding him, just thinking my silent thoughts. And I thought to myself, Mr. Lugosi, if you were somehow or other surviving here in spirit form, looking down at this shell you once inhabited, I think you would be very proud of your final appearance because he looked as though he was just ready to step out of the coffin as he had a thousand times before. And of course I heard the apocryphal story that Boris is supposed to come back from England to see him, and that he looked at him, and that he was buried in his that Mela was buried in his Dracula costume. I don't know whether that was true or not. And Boris is supposed to looked at him and said, "Mela, you're putting us on." He knew what he could do. He felt very secure within himself, who he was. So he didn't care what he didn't care if it was. Sam Katz at Monogram, <laughs> or, or, or Louis B. Mayer. I mean, it, it, it really didn't matter to him. I have existed in the minds of the people as a legend, a vampire created by evil. He was brilliant, and he had ta talents about makeup and redos, and, and he could do weird old things. I mean, he really had so many strange talents. <laughs> Strange and good. Didn't get the chance to do a lot of things I think he could have done. So in a way, being Dracula might have been a professional millstone around his neck, but he created that part, and it was his as long as he lived. Wonderful, wonderful actor. Ironically, despite the demons that plagued him throughout his career, studio indifference, drug dependence, his own proud old world arrogance, the Lugosi legacy is stronger today than ever before. I think it's rather ironic that uh, now Bela Lugosi is actually a greater legend than he ever was in his lifetime. That whole new generations of young people who are seeing his pictures enjoy his performances and love him and read the horror magazines about him and are so interested in his activities, whereas Hollywood virtually forgot him. Will we see you again? Who knows in this crazy world? Dad um, didn't really talk much about his place in history. Uh, he would be amazed that now, so many years after he died, he's still not only remembered but has become an icon. He's a, you know he's a pioneer in American film. His performances were you know very skilled, very unique. Uh, and really, um, uh, he was, I think he felt unappreciated. Uh, he, you know, he obviously knew he was typecast, uh, wished he could bring to audiences the range of his talent because before he ever came to America, he had a wide range of parts that he would play. He was a, a real actor. It's an old story. Here careers are ignited or snuffed out in an instant. Before Hollywood turned her fickle back on Bela, he had known the greatest heights to which a star can soar. Bela and Dracula were uniquely united. Lugosi was responsible for some of the most frightening images ever captured on film. And more, Lugosi was a man whose light Hollywood could never really dim, a star who shines today beyond the grave. But one can never be sure about the undead. Perhaps when you lie safe in bed tonight, you may hear an uncanny howling that more resembles that of a wolf than of a dog. Your window may tremble to a fearsome flapping as a bat wing. Well, good night and sleep. Well...